Hello, friends. Welcome to the F Society IRC podcast, a Mr. Robot review show. I'm your host, Hiroja Shai. Hello, this is Hiroja Shai, and you're listening to F Society IRC podcast, a Mr. Robot review show. And then I'm the moderator of your chat. This is my review of 403 Forbidden. I apologize for the lateness. I was having some audio and video issues, so it took a while for me to fix everything. So you're going to have a double review this week. 403 and then 404. I considered putting them together, but it wasn't going to mesh well. Um, So this one... This one, like each episode really is, I keep saying this, is very emotional, <clears throat> does move the plot, confuses the hell out of me as far as the, the, the long term story of where we are going for this show. But it's still insightful, it, it still gives some, you some hints, hints about the various characters and Maybe, like, maybe if you are able to piece everything together, like, if you have a ha-ha moment. And there have been ha-ha moments throughout um, Mr. Robot the various seasons. Like, the first season, the fact that uh, Mr. Robot himself was a figment of Elliot's imagination or personality, if you will. Many kind of caught on to that. But there was a few that caught on thinking that Mr. Robot might be his father. I was shocked by that. But there was a couple that were hinting like this had to be somebody he knew. Uh, there's stuff in season two. There's still like uh, theories that are floating out from like the Tyra Wellick personality theory, which we'll talk about in 404, not found. Uh, the plane theory about Dom and Darlene. And just, you know, different stuff that's going on. Uh, season three there there was a lot of things going on in that season the whole uh, blowing up buildings which um, the writer uh, Joe from on um, pirate satellite was like probably the only one who got that about the 71 buildings uh, so there's like these little hints like if you if you caught on as the show was going you could figure things out if you watch things in hindsight like when the show is done the season is done and go back you can start picking up and catching all the clues like there's things there they're not uh, pulled out of the ass or like oh you were supposed to figure this out or see these when there was no groundwork laid out and <clears throat> this comes to the moment that we are here in um, this episode where we f- first open up in old tiny land 1983 with uh, the back history of White Rose. And it was a 15 minute uninterrupted look into the history of White Rose. And I'm gonna end discussing about that towards the end of the episode. I wanna talk about some of the other things that happened. But I think it's extremely important because one, it talked about like the character motivation to it, it helped like with some of the plot points of going on with with the overall series arc. Uh, three, like as far as storytelling goes, the particular placement of like I guess you can say the origin story of our villain, uh, White Rose, being placed towards the end of the show versus the beginning, um, kind of, I think the win and where you do this for for conveying like you know, the motivations and origins of certain characters really can um, as far as the audience goes as far you know that's that sense of the placement of the art form of storytelling how we view a character um, when that is done can really shape a viewpoint of a character and I think it's just overall very well done story. So I'm going to turn this effect off and we'll, we'll go to regular regular timey stuff as we talk about uh, the other things that have happened in this episode that are important. But I, I wanted to address the White Rose theme and uh, talk about it towards the end. Um, 
Elliot and of course Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot still talking to us, the audience, and not Elliot, uh, the friend. And it's it's so weird. It it creeps me out. It it, it really does. It, it creeps me out. It's like that old dude in the club trying to hit up on young people. And and when I mean like old dude, I don't mean like the the age that Christian the, the actor Christian Slater Slater is, or even um, the character he's playing his his age. I mean like. You could be like in you were in college or in your twenties or whatever, and it's like a, a thirty year old coming in trying to be in with, in with the cool kids or whatever. It it feels weird. It's like that meme with the, the uh, I should know the actor's name, but you know that meme with the he goes, "What's up, dude?" Carrying the skateboard in high school, and he's like fifty years old. It's just so out of place. It feels weird. It feels very uh, ooky, if you will, and. Uh, it feels off and it shows that even though Elliot and, and Mr. Robot are kind of in tangent if you will they are working together even if they have different motivations and different things that they do for each other it just feels odd it feels off and I'm not exactly sure as an audience how we're supposed to feel about it I know that we are aware of another personality something that's been talked about since pretty much season two but the way the 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 they interact with each other and how they interact with the world i don't know what we're supposed to make of it i just know that when mr robot is talking to us it just feels it just feels a little weird and he's talking to us as la is walking through the through the city and he meets up with one of the very last good people on this show which is Krista because it used to be Dom but Dom's Dom's on the dark side now okay and we'll talk about more about Dom in 404 she's not in this episode but yeah. Dom <laughs> Krista you know has that run in with Elliot and she's a bit pissed and scared at the same time and Elliot approaches her, meets her on the street. She apparently has a new boo. <laughs> Good for her that <laughs> she moved on um, from the other dude. Um, but um, she's like, she basically lays down to him, you know, stop following me, stop approaching me. I can't treat you. And you scare the shit out of me. Which is understandable given what has happened in the last season. Her. Her interaction with Mr. Robot, the overall interaction she's had with Elliot as a whole, the fact that he was first a court mandated uh, patient and then he continued the sessions or she continued the sessions with him. Uh, we weren't quite given the reason why and maybe some of it might have been because he went to jail, she felt bad, she felt maybe she should continue on because he was for that treatment she agreed to because obviously he was in the need of some you know help and then it continued on afterwards and you know he was working with E Corp so maybe they covered the bills or whatever but she kind of knows that not only is he a terrible human being and he is kind of terrible if you think about it um, Elliot the reason why he was there was he had a violent reaction at a, a workplace he destroyed a server room um, and he was ordered by the court to, instead of going to jail, to seek this treatment. Uh, he was a drug user. Uh, he was violent towards her. Um, he does obviously have this kind of, and this doesn't make him a violent person. It just means that he is a person who has a, a significant need of help, uh, of treatment, really. Um, you know, he's a drug addict. Uh, he has these personalities, but he he also may have been part of, in her opinion, in pretty much confessed to her in the sense of Tara's acts. If she doesn't know if it's because of his delusions or he actually did it. And as to why she never reported him, I'm not positive on it, but maybe because she has fear. Uh, fear of him, fear of the reaction, fear that she could be wrong um, or, or some other motivation, but she never reported him to, to law enforcement. But clearly she cut ties with him. And this interaction, because of this interaction, Elliot is like devastated. She's like, she's probably one of the very few positive people in his life and someone who was attempting to help him. And he he just basically was going the, to her to, to say, thank you, you know, I've talked to my other self, you know, Mr. Robot, and we're working together. I, he, 
he was devastated by the fact that she's afraid of him and it really it really affected Elliot and I think that's very important um, that he still has this capacity to, to meet these certain emotional levels if you will but um, and we'll find out a little bit more about that towards towards this, the storyline here of his but yeah so this the scene ends and we find out that Elliot's being followed. It turns out is the guy that shot Veer's brother. So my favorite character <laughs> is back on the show, Veer. Our lunatic, conniving, charismatic drug dealer, the wild card to all of this. This this is the asteroid that all the scientists talk about, you know, in theory that can destroy the Earth. Even though we have like all the detectors out there, at least the ones that we have out there, trying to detect all the asteroids, this is the one they say that we're not going to detect or not going to see because we just we can't detect all the space, you know, out there. Really, we just can't. And this is the thing that's just going to come down and just like the dinosaurs. Okay. Um. He obviously sent this guy to follow Elliot. We we don't. We kind of know the motivations. Uh, he meets up with Veer. I'm going to get back to Elliot, but I just want to talk about this part because it's very funny. Veer is at the restaurant where uh, Shayla and Elliot met up with the brother to prove that Shayla was still here. She was alive, okay. Turns out moments afterwards, dead. She, so obviously Veer still controls that restaurant. He is putting drugs in these turkeys and he's handing it out to these kids who are supposed to take it to their mamas. So their mamas get like a turkey or chicken. Um, I think it was chicken maybe. And these drugs that they're supposed to sell. <laughs> okay. And so Veer is asking this guy, you know, how I was following Elliot. And he's just telling him like, this dude, I don't understand why you just did not take him and, and, and make him do what you want. And, and Veer is like, that's not the point. I, You can't motivate Elliot like that. You can't motivate someone like Elliot. He, he wants Elliot to be his partner so he can take over New York. He wants to get his drug trade back up and going. And I have a couple theories about this. He obviously must be aware, he knows of Elliot's hackney skills. He knows it from Shayla and just the fact that he got out of prison because of Elliot. Uh, he probably might even know about it, the time that Elliot spent in prison and what went down there. So he knows Elliot is this very sophisticated uh, hacker person that can basically do what he needs to do to take the drug trade back online, but in a more sophisticated uh, privacy manner way to where he's not getting caught, unlike what his brother did, who deliberately made it sure that Veer's fingerprints were everywhere and uh, the cops figured it out so Veer can go to prison. Um, and so this, his minion, if you will, is not getting it. And Veer's like, come on, tell me about the day. Tell me who he's going you know, out. And he says, yeah, he met with some lady, but I don't know, they weren't going together. It was just weird. And, and Veer's like, the devil's in the details. You need to tell me the details. And the guy, the minion is not getting it. He's not understanding or explaining anything. So Veer says, give me your photos. Let me see. Let me see this, you know, this woman. And he, get, he get, sees a picture of Krista, and he looks at Elliot, and you can see the moment where Elliot is like crest and fallen and he's uh, you know devastated by the knowledge that Chris is f afraid of him and Veer just zooms in and looks at him and he goes that is somebody that knows something you know uh, I want to know her and he picks up one of the kids and he shows the kid the photo and he goes what do you what does this mean to you what do you think and the kid goes it looks like he's getting yelled at by his mom <laughs> Uh, yeah, like he he's done something wrong, you know, and that's what I look like when I'm in trouble. Like he's in trouble. He goes, hmm, interesting. And he goes to the minion. How is it the kid gets it and you don't? And Vera, you know, basically fires off the handle and kills the dude. And then he sends the kid away, and he's like, I'm gonna. She knows something. I need her. So once again through either inaction or actions or a series of actions of Elliot, somebody else that's close to him is in danger and possibly going to get killed.
because that's just how Veer rolls. And that's just how Elliot's world ro rolls right now. He's just getting people killed left and right. It's just... It's just a thing that he does. He thinks he's saving the world, and he ends up destroying it. It's, uh, so, nice to see Veer back on the show. Nice to see Krista, the character, is back on the show. But, oh okay, like I said from the very first episode, it's it it it's nobody's getting out alive. Nobody. I always thought maybe Krista. Looks like maybe Flipper's going to be the only thing to get out alive. Flipper and QRT are gonna get out alive. Actually, I don't think we have seen QRT. QRT's a fish that was in Angela's room, Angela's apartment. I'm thinking that fish is dead. So, Flipper. Flipper, who's with the landlord, might be the only living creature that had a close proximity to Elliot that's gonna get out of this alive. Everyone else, done so. So, <clears throat> that's our check-in with Veer. Back to Elliot. Um, he and Darlene, again, cross communications after last episode with their mom. Thought the things were kind of coalescing together, finding out Susan Jacobs and all that stuff. And. <sighs> nah. They're still not communicating together very well. Elliot's still withholding, he's not telling her everything. He's rushing into stuff. She wants to plan it, stick to the plan. He doesn't, he doesn't think they have enough time to do everything. Again, it's all about time because, you know, once White Rose ship launches, they're, they're done so. And he yells at her. He gets kind of a little violent. Um, she's basically ready to, she's going to walk away. He goes, this is how we have to do things. It all resolves around the fact that, that, that Darlene found somebody through social media, through the one person that is one individual um, that's connected through the Susan Jacob information that can give them access to Cypress Bank. And this woman is single, going through a divorce, uh, might possibly lose the custody of her kids because of a drug issue, and she is the only person that has access to, from America to the Cypress National Bank. And her name is Olivia. We're, we're gonna put a pin on that aspect of Olivia for a moment. So Elliot's looking through the social media stuff, sees that she has an okay Cupid date. He's just gonna go and try to social engineer his way. Mr. Awkward Elliot is gonna social engineer his way into a, the life of Olivia somehow. But before he does that, and it's Christmas Eve, mind you, he does go to her apartment. And he tries to see if he can get to a lockbox because you have to, in order to connect to the Cypress National Bank, you have to have a particular computer machine that connects you to uh, servers, that connects you to another server that gives you access to Cypress National Bank. He's looking for that particular machine so that he can access it and gain entry into the Cypress National Bank so they can overall take the money from the De Dexis group, White Rose, and this will kind of solve or end everything. It's it's not, but that's the plan. Um, he finds out that he needs a particular key fob that she obviously has on her and is not at the apartment and he won't be able to access the machine. Now, the show does show like all the different steps that he does to order to be able to access the information that he and Darlene need to get into the Cypress National Bank. And I'll have a link in the show notes. They actually have the real web, web pages in there where you SAH into something and VPN and this website and then the key fob website, the key fob that gives you the code. The key fobs are like these USB sticks. <laughs> Do I have one? They look like something like this. Smite Tails USB stick. And then they'll have like a, a screen like on the show and you just insert it into the machine and it's a it's a basically electronic version of a, a key, of a, a strong key. And 
they they have the this out on the um, out in the world, and I'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, it might be part of the ARG game. I'm not sure. There were, there was a message and everything attached and associated with it. And I, again, that's linked in the show notes. Um, <coughs> and for those who don't know, um, the the show has for the, each season has had what is called an alternative reality game associated with the show where you can get all these little hints and if you solve it you get like goodies and prizes from the show and it's been going on for each season and there's and they've been pretty um for those who are into it they people are very much like them they're very well done it's very engaging you see kind of some insight to the show or a little bit uh kind of like a parallel story to a sense but nothing that's so off off book or off key that it one either ruins the show or gives you a hidden knowledge that um, other people that are just simply watching the show wouldn't know. It just adds a, an additional layer. So, he lies to Darlene about his access and stuff like that, and he's going to go and social engineer this woman, Olivia. Um, I don't like the fact that this song and dance with Elliot and Darlene, the fact that they cannot communicate with one another, it seems just like a cyclical thing of theirs. And when there's death on the line, I know Darlene in this point is probably being the has consistently being the bigger person. But goddamn it, Elliot, you, you gotta stop, or you're you're such cross purposes. Like he didn't even know from when the moment Price says Susan Jacobs, he didn't even know about Susan Jacobs and the connection to, until Darlene told told him. And the reasons why she didn't tell him is because he wouldn't understand. Like why Susan Jacobs had to go, basically, and what happened, um, because of the lack of communications. And there's all these other little things, like, if he were to communicate better with his sister, or just in general, I, I think we wouldn't be quite in the predicament that we are. But because Elliot is just, since Angela's death, and this time crunch is on this deadline, um, he's just off. And he's making mistakes that I don't think previous Elliot, the Elliot before Angela, uh, would have made. Um, and they're catching up to him. He's been lucky so far, but the Dark Army, as we learned from the White Rose storyline, is on his ass. <laughs> okay? They're on his ass. And from Dom, and just from previous encounters, we know how they solve their problems. Um, it just... It reminds me of like, like the endings of like, like Mortal Kombat when you died and you, you had to you got like killed and you. I'm talking like the arcade version. I'm not talking about like when you're on the console at home or a friend's house and you can like restart. Like, you're you're fighting and you're fighting it out and you're you know you only had like one quarter left and you use the last quarter and you maybe got seven eighth and you got the furthest you've gotten so far and you and you die and there's nothing you can do like you can't there's no more lives there's no more quarters <laughs> everything is done it's like donezo you're done for the day you got your tickets you now you gotta just watch the other kids play video games and there's nothing you can do and you're just like ugh, devastated and you you gotta listen to the the the, the kids Hackling at you, and none of them are even way better than you are. But they, they maybe they have more quarters, or they, they had next, and so therefore they can either continue the play from where you are at and continue off of your hard work, or you know start over and start their play. But yeah, it just it sucks. It sucks. It's final, and there's nothing you can do. And the next day, over it might be a while before you even get back to the arcade to play the game. But anyways, it was just the, the dunzo feeling, like when the dark army just takes you out, you, you know, and you're in its snares, you're, you're, you're done, you just know you're done, you can feel it in your bones, it's like, ugh, you're all icky, and I think Elliot is starting to feel that pressure, don't think Darlene is so much, because I don't think she fully realizes how done they are, or maybe she's just way better at suppressing that self of her, that, that scared rabbit that, like, you know, should take off or something. So, Elliot and Darlene at cross purposes. Uh, it seemed like at first, like Darlene had left, but it turns out she's still back into the 
to taking, you know, Olivia and uh, trying to figure, you know, into the Cypress National Bank. We don't find that until much later, but it seemed like for that scene that she had left them, like left Team Elliot again, like bounced, took her ball home, but that's not, that wasn't the case. Um, so Elliot goes to this bar. The, Olivia's sitting there. She's been waiting there for a couple of hours for this date that doesn't show up, basically. he's, And turns out he ends up being really late. So Elliot is like waiting, watching her, observing her, trying to figure it out. But Elliot is such an awkward dude. Uh, it's amazing he wasn't even to get to the Shayla or the fact that, well, it turns out Angela wasn't really into Elliot. was more into the robot, Mr. Robot personality. But, um... <laughs> So Mr. Robot takes over, <laughs> and he was like, you know, I'm sorry if we have a long man, no one should leave you, you know, total dick, Christmas Eve, you shouldn't leave you like this, buy you a drink. She accepts, uh, they start talking a little bit, they go back to her table, sit down, and then it switches to Elliot, and Elliot it's awkward having a bit of a conversation you know like what brings you she's like what brings you this Christmas Eve oh he's had a fight with his sister his mom died I swear to God patches And she, she, you know, Olivia goes, oh, I'm sorry about your mom. And he goes, sorry for what? Like, it doesn't click that someone would say, I'm sorry about the loss of your mother. Uh, <laughs> he's more concerned about the fight with Darlene than his mother. He goes, oh, we were really close. Then she opens up about her dad, the things she put her family through, about the drugs. Elliot admitted that he was a heroin addict. And we find out it's been nine months since he's been clean, except for the hot shot he got from Price. And it's just a series of like red flags that would cause anyone <laughs> to leave coming out of Elliot's mouth. But she sits there and stays. And eventually the dude that she was supposed to meet with shows up and he goes, Hey, Olivia, sorry, I'm here for the date. Okay, Cupid. And she's like, no, I, you know, I'm not that person. And it gets a little more awkward. He gets more assistant. She, she decides to leave. Leave it Elliot and the dude there. I think the dude name was Evan. And <laughs> so Elliot runs out the door to go go to her and he ends up kissing her. So he ends up kissing her. They go back to her place. They have sex. Uh, she falls asleep, kind of, sort of. Elliot's back at the apartment, gets the key fob, goes into her bathroom. And it's like a weird shot. They did this before when he was at uh, her apartment, but it's now again where it's like kind of like your above ceiling shot where you can see all the different rooms going on. And it's like very like mouse trappy, very claustrophobic. And so you, it caused a little bit of tension when Elliot was in the bathroom. Like, is he going to get caught by her? And he kind of sort of does like, but he plays it off like he was at her drugs. That she had which was um, I think oxycodone uh, but he was able to take the current number iterations from the key fob and send it to Darlene uh, he finds out from he's using the messaging app signal he finds out from price that the the disc group is gonna meet tomorrow Christmas Day we'll get back to that uh, Olivia shows up they bond a little bit more and it's like supposed to be like this tender emotional moment but it just very much rings false and here's why it rings false because this is not how really what we've seen Elliot act like I mean we saw this like first season with Shayla and we thought it was weird but we find more from the backstory that he and Shayla had a relationship it just wasn't a one-up hookup or whatever and Olivia seems to be like almost pattern like a, a template or a bizarre clone of Shayla and there's other things about her background to where she's the one person that is the go-to person American contact point in New York to the Cypress National Bank um, we find out from her background that she's going through a divorce uh, that she has a drug habit and 
that she went to night school so that's how she worked her way up to be able to get into the financial system so she's not from like an Ivy League school or has a master's degree or like 10 20 years experience in the financial system you would think as a go-to person that's the go-between between the dark army uh, Minister Zion, this Dexis group, and the, the money, Cypress National Bank. You would think it'd be like one of these Ivy League people or someone with a much more significant experience. Plus, she wouldn't have this baggage where she could be uh, got at. Like, either um, like her divorce can cause financial strain. Uh, her drug habit, things of that nature that would either expose her to other people that might get to her or expose their money where she might like uh, because of her financial strait and her drug habit or whatever take their money. So it doesn't really make sense that she would be that person. Not that it doesn't happen, I'm just saying like with financial systems we do know that there's some type, sometimes these kind of checks in place when it comes to these things where people are either move from one department to another until the situation resolves itself or they can't get into those positions because of this history. And so I think she's either dark army or something's off. And the other thing is again even Elliot taking the key fob and being able to access the Cypress National Bank if she was a legitimate it means that Elliot now has exposed this woman who has a child um, to death. Like the Dark Army's going to take her out because she was the vulnerable point that allowed for Elliot and Darlene, Team Elliot, to go after the Cypress National Bank. So there's that. If she's Dark Army, then she has just laid a trap or part of a trap to, to take out Team Elliot. And if she fails, <laughs> we know how Dark Army does to his failed operatives. But it means that Team Elliot is donezo sooner than we think. So the the whole thing was just off in general. Um, I do think Elliot's emotions were very gen genuine. Like he was actually finally connecting with somebody because he hasn't been emotionally connecting with Mr. Robot or Darlene um, or even to himself for a while. He's just kind of been wallowing in this anger grief thing. And for him to make that connection with somebody was it was heartbreaking because you can kind of see the downfall coming. Uh, so Elliot leaves Olivia's apartment. He's Mr. Robot's tagging along and he stops. He was supposed to go back to All Safe uh, to the hideout but he's being followed and he says he's been followed since the subway with his white vans, same type of white vans that Dom has noticed and uh, he says let's go home uh, because we don't want to leave them to the secret headquarters. So, <clears throat> Elliot gets home. Mind you, still Christmas Eve. He gets home and there's somebody in his place. And who is there? <gasps> Big dummy Tyro Wellick. Okay, pretty face Tyro Wellick. And he's there and he's there to tell Elliot that he's got the CEO, po CEO position of Evil Corp. That's the big news. Elliot, from seeing him and seeing Tyra Wellick flapping his lip it's like dude it's like, what are you doing man like goes up and puts his mouth over <laughs> Tyra Wellick's face to try to get him to shut the hell up and then writes in the prettiest handwriting I've seen in a very long time uh, they're they're listening <laughs> and then points out to the window that Tyra Wellick that there's a dark army basically operative outside in a white van and I'm glad we got Tyra Wellick after seeing him briefly in episode 1 and him mentioned in episode 2 and just like seeing him it, it was nice it's been a while Elliot and, Ty and Tyrell in the, in the you know in the same room not since you know really last season when Price showed up and gave Tyra Wellick the CTO position and they were fighting and stuff but god big dummy Tyra Wellick see I know Tyra Wellick is a very skilled hacker and very skilled at probably for the most part navigating um, the corporate world at least up to middle management because uh, he never got past that until he killed somebody and then killed some more people um, so he wasn't that skilled even with the help of his wife Joanne but 
he's an example of people that are very skilled at something like a like a Tom Brady or a Brett Favre or something like really skilled at football but I wouldn't trust them to cook my turkey <laughs> okay all right they might not have culinary skills they might be good with the football but you put them in the kitchen or ask them to fix your car and there's oil and the stuff is on fire you know uh, sometimes Tyrell Welk does these things where it's like oh dude just flapping your lips come on man you should know better you should have like had one the little box that you know Elliot was had for like the longest time when he had a conversation you turn it on and a little noise maker write it out talk about something you know say hey it's Christmas Eve let me take you out somewhere just thinking that somebody might be listening and then writing out like hey dude I got the CEO position what do you want to do what's our next move you know on paper something <laughs> he's like but uh no and so that ends you know the Elliot storyline so far in this episode. And it was great. You know, we got Darlene, we got Tyra Wellick, we got Veer, Krista, Elliot, and now this new chick, Olivia, that's either Dark Army um, or Innocent Person. Either way, both hands are getting chopped off because nobody's getting out of this alive. Uh, <laughs> even the henchman that killed the, the um, Veer's brother because he wasn't observant enough when it comes to Elliot got done so. I mean, there's no winning on this show. I mean, if you're associated with Elliot by proxy, like, forget the Kevin Bacon games. I, I would love to see the the uh, connection to Elliot and, like, how you died or when you died. Like, how strong the connection. Because I'm sure the stronger the connection, the more gruesome the death is. I mean, look what happened to Triton and Moby. Uh, but I would like to see like someone chart that out. Uh, I don't know how it was like six 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 ways to die Elliot style. I, I, I don't know how you would call that game. But yeah. <laughs> so uh and then we find out more about Tyra Wellig and Elliot as a dynamic duo uh for four oh four not found occurs and we'll talk about it then. But <sighs> big beautiful dummy. So that's the end of their story. And now we are going to travel back in time because I've been wearing this 80s jean jacket, not for nothing, as we talk about. So we're back in ancient times of 1983. And we find out that White Rose has a new assistant, or an old assistant, if you will, named Chin. And they're together. They are uh, a partnership. Um, in every sense of the word. They are at a board meeting, an IBM board meeting, where they are doing a deal which is based on real life stuff, uh, where China strikes a deal with IBM, and IBM agrees to partner partner with China to create these different types of computers within China, and China basically, uh, <laughs> as uh, Jean, uh, White Rose's persona uh, for the Chinese government, She's like, I look forward to stealing all your shit, because I'm not paying for it. And um, Jin is her translator, um, translating, you know, what the Americans saying. They don't don't understand Chinese, and they wouldn't bother. They didn't even have a, a translator on their side. They had basically the Chinese guy <laughs> translating for the for the entire thing. It's it's very dumb uh, and arrogant on their part. Um, which is probably why IBM lost some of their supercomputer super computer information to the Chinese government. Uh, <clears throat> so we go back to, you know, they, they seal the deal, if you will, and they go back to the hotel room where we see that Jin and um, uh, John are in a very intimate relationship. Um, they're massaging feet, they're having a conversation. Uh, Jin's like, you know, now that you've had this IBM deal, Maybe you will get that U.S. ambassador position and we can come to America and finally, you know, live an authentic life. They no longer have to basically suppress who they are, being, you know, gay um, or in the case of uh, White Rose, a trans person, uh, suppress their identities anymore. They can live a free existence. And this causes White Rose to have a bit of a pause because 
there's something else that she's been basically, you know, hiding from Jin um, this entire time. So uh, Jin has the the Rolex, well not Rolex, the Casio watch uh, that beeps beeps just like White Rose. It's actually the, the same watch, and. Uh, You know, White Rose is like, why do you, why do you do that with yourself? You know, time. He goes, because it's you know, fifteen minutes lets me know when the next you know the meeting. We're supposed to meet down at the hotel bar and talk to these guys, and you know, as a kind of meet and face. And White Rose is like, why don't you just go ahead and go? I'll do the IBM stuff. And uh, by the time the phone call they're supposed to have back to China is done, you know, you'll be done with that. I'll be done with my thing and then we can be together. And in the background, there's like, you know, USA Network, there's the, the thing is playing, there's um, Karma Karma, not Karma Karma, but Boy George is on, on the television set. It's very 80s. Um, Jin does go to the bar and meet um, with the guys and has a few drinks. Um, when he comes back, uh, White Rose is waiting for him, and she's in her persona, her, she's in her dress. And um, she says, don't turn the light on, leave in the dark, she gets very intrigued. And then um, the light, you know, White Rose turns the lights on and reveals, you know, this is something I've been wanting to show you, to tell you about myself. I am a woman. This is who I am. This is my authentic self I'm sharing with you. And at first, because typically what goes with, you know, real life in some of these stories, you think there would be some transphobia or some violence. And it turns out, no, that's not the case. Jen accepts White Rose um, as a woman and em embraces her. And uh, White Rose had explained about the dress, how it's very simple, but very elegant. It's a black and white dress. It used to be his mother's, but it's in his now. And... Um, which is a different story he told Dom when he said it was his sisters. But we all knew that was a lie. Um, <laughs> maybe he doesn't have a sister, maybe he does. And they embrace each other. And this is in the past, and we also have, like, basically White Rose reflecting upon the things that have happened to him. They brought him to this point. He's talking to his current assistant. Um, oh, I thought I wrote her name down. I did not. She, you know, she has to fix. She said this dress is very important. The day that my project ships, I want this to be pressed and done. And she brings up some stuff, <laughs> some stuffies. White Rose is not really ready to hear. And I, I'm going to cover the the um, the future stuff, the current timeline, if you will. Um, she says, you know, you don't believe. Uses her own words against her. You you don't believe in coincidences. We have Elliot. You have um, Elliot still out there. You have Lomac uh, dying, killing himself, and then you have Price resigning. That all happened in kind of like you know the 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 suicide of the lawyer and resigning, all in successions. That's that's you no know, coincidence. You know. What if they're planning something to move against you? We should do something about Elliot. And White Rose is like, no, it's not doing anything about that. And she, and she goes like, project, you know, it's basically she should also at the same time starts having starts thinking about things. His assistant's pressing against her, and she's like, I've been waiting three hundred two days for my project. My patience is is waning. Um, and she starts thinking about this, and she goes, watch Elliot. Um, if Elliot and Price are together, what a better way to um, disrupt somebody's plan is by adjusting their timeline. So basically, he says, um, we're going to let Price resign. She says, well, you won't have a CEO. He says, put Tyra Wellick in the position. Um, make sure the dance group's here tomorrow, Christmas Day. She goes, we, this won't happen. He's like, make it happen. You know, he, he wants his project the frick out of this country and into the Congo. And um, you kind of starting to see, we've seen little hints of White Rose's like bit of a temper, if you will. 
and coldness and violence streak. We've seen it pretty much like hints of it every season. We saw it with the rip down the Christmas tree. We saw our flaming stuff. I think it was season one or season two. And we know she just this project is everything. This is a culmination of many, many things, many, many years, going all the way back to basically eighty three to now. And she's finito with this. And so by her assistant pressing against White Rose about Price resigning and about Elliot being out there and um, maybe not having quite as much control as they should over him or at least not getting rid of him, um, they accelerated in the timeline to where we now know from this tidbit, you know, Price did the Christmas Day event, uh, that's when the meeting's going to happen and Tyrell being CEO. It, it does kind of disrupt the plans because then that means the heist has to happen sooner for the Cypress National Bank stuff. Uh, even though Elliot didn't quite know that when he was getting all that information from Olivia, he now, he you know, he kind of now knows that he needs to accelerate things or disrupt things. And I don't know exactly if this is going to bite White Rose in the, the butt in any way by disrupting um, Elliot's plans. Um, it might make them more finale, you know, more finality to them, but it just shows that her determination. And the reason why we know this determination is when we go back to 1983, um, we see um, that she's in love with this man named Chin. They go back to Beijing, you know, kind of victorious, if you will. We're not exactly sure like when in 83 the timeline you know passage if it will happening um and it's like a, a party going on and it turns out that Jin is getting married to a woman something that his a marriage his father is arranged um White Rose is at the party the bride is going around greeting and talking to everybody she says the groom's not come out he goes I will go talk talk to him White Rose goes and talks to Jin he says hey you got my flowers he goes, oh yeah, White Rose is a funeral flower. He goes, yeah, you know, I thought you might like it. It's kind of a bit of a joke. And Jin's like, I can't do this. I can't marry this woman. It's not who I am. I don't want to do this anymore. And White Rose is like, you know, you have to put on a face. You have to do this. You have to be patient so we can be together. And Jin's like, when someone asks you to be patient, they're asking you to surrender. And this is what kind of triggers his thought process, triggers White Rose to disrupt uh, Elliot's plans and Price's plans, see if they're together and stuff like that. Um, this reflection, if you will. And Jin's like, you know, realizes that White Rose didn't get the U.S. ambassador position. And White Rose says the reason why he didn't get it is because he was offered a much higher position which was the Ministry of, of Security which is the same position he's held basically since this time and Shin feels betrayed he's devastated because he he basically tells White Rose he can't live in this world anymore he can't live in a world where he can't be who he is and if he's not who he is he's not living and Jin's like you know be patient, we'll be able to get there, um, you just have to, if, you know, you just have to do these steps and we'll, we will be together, you know, he's promising and Shin just doesn't believe it, he's not very convinced, he basically tells her he probably should go, um, you know, he's, and he's not wrong, I mean, at the times, even in the states in 83, it still wasn't um, acceptable to be, to be uh, any type of queer person, trans, bisexual, uh, gay, lesbian. Um, there was much violence, discrimination. It was in the midst of the AIDS, uh, AIDS epidemic where there wasn't any treatment or knowledge or acknowledgement of the HIV virus that was, target, that was hitting this community, but also um, a wide swath of many other communities as well. But because they were either poor or black or people of color, or in this case, you know, primarily homosexuals. Uh, of the you know the trans and queer community in the various queer communities uh, the government resources weren't allocated to it became a full-blown crisis to where there was you know such attention and protest and 
consternation to where eventually had to be those resources had to be allocated and had to be addressed. Meanwhile, you know, millions of people died, not just in the states but around the world from the lack of action by this by uh, the hospital systems, by uh, government, by institutions to address this particular um, disease. And it's still, in some parts of this, uh, the world, is still not being properly addressed. Batman, behave. Here, come here. <laughs> Big cat. <clears throat> Feeling very Bond villainous here with my cat. Or I should say my cat, but this cat, Batman. So, not that the states would have been even better for them to be, you know, out in the open as a couple or together, or at least have a bit of freedom. It most certainly would have been better than in the, in the status in China, where even now uh, being of that part of that community can ostracize you. Now with this whole social credit thing, it can eliminate their ability to move or tra move across the, you know your city because you can access transportation or out of the city, jobs, rentals, um, people being, you know, jailed, uh, gulags, things of that nature. It was just very extremely difficult and possibly, you know, death really to be, um, be your truthful self in that, uh, in China. And but Chen just he couldn't wait and like he said he did not want to be in this world any longer he did not want to live this lie he, d he didn't want to be in Beijing and he just felt defeated and he he killed himself he stabbed himself in front of a white rose the blood sprayed of course on the white rose it was very dramatic very final it was obvious it wasn't like a cry for help or anything like he did himself in and he bled, bled out in White Rose's arms. Um, White Rose lost a lot, the, pretty much I think probably the love of, of her life. And it kind of gives you the, the kind of the motivation of White Rose wanting to create a machine that could potentially transport you either into another world, uh, bring back people like he told Angela, or some kind of time travel thing. Are you gonna leave? Is that what you're gonna do? No, of course not. And um, I liked this 15 minute, like, kind of short story about the origins of White Rose. But it goes back, you know, and it gives us character motivation. It moved the pot, plot line for. Uh, it moved the uh, plot a little bit forward with the fact that, you know, uh, Tyrell Wilkes is going to be CEO, um, the Deus group is going to be on Christmas Day, so it, it again causes a very tension and crunch time for Team Elliot about the things that they need to do. And the fact that the Dark Army is kind of on their heels or on their ass, if you will. And it did those things, but I was thinking it was just the origin story of all, overall of a scene this about White Rose, this mysterious character that's been part of the show from the very beginning. How this wasn't even ta shown to us in the beginning or in season two. Like we saw kind of like the origins a bit of Elliot in, in a sense in season two with the the mess and the origins of F Society. We kind of seen a bit of the origin story of Mr. Robot in the sense that we know from Darlene that Elliot pushed himself out of the window, which is something people have suspected for a very long time. We got Darlene's origin story with her telling about her kidnapping and stuff like that, about her, why she's the way she is. Um, Angela with her mom. We've seen some kind of character depths and hints in the past. But for White Rose to be um, last, I think it's important because while well, you have a great amount of empathy and sympathy for White Rose, she has killed a lot of people because of this, because of creating this device. Before it was like kind of like this very machinationist, like ex existential type of deal. Like she wants to create this thing for whatever purpose, and she's forged it by will, if you will, and it's 
very like very academic in a sense when you think about it about the, the machine and all the pieces and how I described how she was able to get the De Dexis group if you will and I forming it if you will from Price's origin story of the Dexis group forming it and manipulating these however many figures there are these multi-billionaires um, people in powerful positions and manipulate them not in the chess way but go where she surrounds them and flips their pieces to her pieces and she controls the board until eventually she controls the entire board um, the if this had been done earlier I think our sympathies would have lied very heavily kind of with White Rose because she was doing it for love if you will which is a you know a very powerful motivator and even though she would and has done these evil acts like the 71 building blow up uh, even then still we would still have some sympathy with her like we had some sympathy for Angela because she, we know she wanted to get her mother back and that's why she was doing what she was doing but she was but also we knew she was being very naive and manipulated in a sense and that she was thinking that they were just blowing up buildings or property and not killing people <laughs> like that there was an actual evacuation plan and she was going with urban but there wasn't and so and how maybe she convinced herself of that like oh yeah there's an evacuation plan no one's gonna die no. <laughs> you know we still had sympathy for Angela we didn't maybe necessarily view her completely as the full monster that she was even the same thing with Elliot as we've seen things from his very unreliable narrative perspective we still have empathy and sympathy for our protagonist even though he came up with the 71 building plan he did that not just Tyrell well he did that as well <laughs> whether it was Mr. Robot or not he did that as well um, the fact that you know Trenton, Moby, and, and Cisco, and even Ramon, uh, to some extent, is are dead. The people that have died because of the the crashing in the economy, they're kicking out of homes, uh, level of violence, the trash, the homelessness, all the things that kind of ricocheted off from a collapse of an economy, whether it be a local economy. We've seen that before in the past, or like 2008, or really like seven to. It's still ongoing, but like the some of the bulk of the worst of it was like 2007 to about 2013, like a really big chunk of period of time that no one really, really talks about. It's like very abstract. People got kicked out of their homes. Some people got saved. It's, it's some of the. I think it'll be a while before we see some really hard, concrete numbers about this period of time, but you know people were killing themselves during during that time they would uh, because they lost everything they lost their homes their businesses and so they killed themselves or they would this is something that not just men but predominantly men do is they kill them kill their wife their kids and then themselves this this pa this family side thing that was going on um, and you know, we see it some to some extent right now with um, this new thing with healthcare, where people are going to healthcare debt, and because they can't pay it, they kill themselves, or they find out their di diagnosis and they and they kill themselves rather than burden their family. Um, you know, Elliot crashed the world economy, and even though we saw some of the background in New York, he a lot of that is on him, but we still have empathy and sympathy towards him. Because we save this story for last and it gives us some kind of aha insights into White Rose and why she wants to either get to or create another world and reference that to her dark army and particularly Grant where she goes, I will see you in the next world, basically. They will be together. Um, I still have, I give no fucks about White Rose. I still think she's going to win. I think she's the Bond villain that we don't deserve, but we need in life. Um, but it's, it's still like, no, you've killed all these people. You killed people or characters that I've cared about. And I'm sorry you lost your lover, but you're an evil goddamn person. And I think it's a very interesting 
how Sam Ismail and the writers here uh, did that with White Rose, where they gave us this very beautiful love story towards the end here, an, an origin story of White Rose, and some of the hints of the motivation that has driven her to be so resilient and so focused on this project. But at the same time, because it's kind of like after all these actions and all these things that we've seen, like with the Dark Army's done, its purpose and its evilness and the, the just evil, heinous acts that, you know, we've known White Rose to participate in or has hinted to, um, no fucks. <laughs> no fucks at all. Where if this had been like in the first season or the second season, you would probably still even at this point be like, oh, well, you know, she's doing it for love. And she's maybe this real world, this other world thing can happen, and you would kind of internally justify it as you're going as a viewer, as the friend, if you will, um, uh, about what's going on here. But now, I I can't I can't give I I I do have sympathy for her, but I can't empathize with White Rose, and. I think it's brilliant on the part of Sam Ismail and the storytelling here where he saved the origin story for last because even if White Rose's or you know motivations are a bit um, noble because she's you know doing it for true love in that classic sense like that white knight romantic sense that we have in our sh story architectures um, it's not enough it's not enough because of the, the bloodshed and the cost, if you will. And so I give it to them. I give it to Sam Ismail. Um, beautiful story. Beautiful cam. But nah. White Rose. I mean, I hope she gets it. I don't know if she will. I have a strong feeling that she's going to win. And I will still be happy, you know, if she wins. I think it will, will be a satisfying ending. But at the way things are going, I just don't see how ten, Team LA can pull a Hail Mary and win. I just don't. But um, these are my thoughts on the whole matter and uh, my review of this episode, 403 Forbidden. Uh, <laughs> I know it was a bit of it was a little late, and I apologize for that. I'll try to make these more timely. But these have been very dense episodes where there's been some layers and some thoughts and some emotions and tie-ins to the past to where you had to think about it for a while before, or at least I did before I could, you know, talk about it. But um, my name is Rosia Shine. This is F Society RSC podcast. I am your moderator, closing this channel, logging off. And um, until next time, my friends.